I missed it. I was getting changed, and I heard a testimony for the power of prayer. I got to hear about it, but I didn't get to be involved in it. I will tell you one of the ways I was involved with it was on Friday when I reached out to Jerry, told him I was praying for him. And then he got, I got that phone call from him. Praise God. Praise God. And then yesterday during the work day, 13 people out here, amen. We appreciate that. Jerry was out here working with us yesterday. I got pictures to prove it. I got pictures he had a shovel in his hand because Bonnie said she would never believe that we'd see Jerry working. So I got two pictures in two different locations of Jerry with a shovel. So praise God, man. <laughs> praise God. So week number three of the grind, persevering through this tough life. And, you know, the first week, we, as we looked at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and, and Jesus actually said, he will know the suffering he has to do for me. He was going to have to suffer in order to follow Jesus. And I think a lot of times we forget that in our own lives, that there's suffering involved as we follow Jesus. You know, everything's not going to be peachy all the time. It's not going to be roses. It's not going to be puppies. There, there's going to be times of adversity in our lives. There's going to be times that we have to suffer. And then last week we, we asked that question, is Christ enough? You know, because all of us, if I were to ask you, is Christ enough, you'd be quick to say yes. But then we started talking about the times in our life that is Christ really enough for us? Is he really enough and how we need to put our trust and faith in Jesus and everything we need to do? And we need to remain focused in him. Now, today we're going to continue to look at the Apostle Paul's life and in one of the writings to the church in Corinth. Now, the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul actually planted that church, and he wrote two different letters. So as we're looking at it today, we are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll get there in just a little bit. But what we're going to find out is the Apostle Paul was able, through all of this tension, all this persevering, this grind of his life, he was able to choose joy. He was able to choose joy during them times. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we look at this. And just to kind of give you an idea, whether you're here in the room or you joined us for online church, I want you to put your hand out in front of you. Don't be shy. Put your hand out. Now I want you to go ahead and make a fist. Make a, as tight as you can make that fist and keep holding it as tight as you can hold it. And I'm going to keep talking while you're holding that fist, so make sure you hold it really good. Because while you're sitting there holding that fist, think about things that you hold on to tightly. And you're really holding on to it. And you know, some of you, your nails may be digging into the palm of your hands by now. Or you may be feeling a little bit of pain. Your forearm's starting to tighten up. You know, you're losing blood in your fingers. But, but we're going to hold on to it, right? Because this is what we do in life. We, we hold on to things really tightly. So go ahead and keep holding. And, and I'll tell you when to let go in about 30 minutes so as I go through this sermon. <laughs> no, just kidding. You guys can go ahead and release it. But if you think about that, think about the stuff that in our life we hold on to. And it builds this tension inside of our lives because we hold on to things very tightly. And a lot of times when we hold on to stuff real tightly, it, sometimes it's stuff that doesn't matter. It's stuff that makes no sense, but, but because it's something that we may feel dear to our own heart, we hold on to it really tight. And it may be grief. It may be the loss of a loved one. It may be, you know, sorrow. It may be unforgiveness. You know, that, that, man, I can't believe what this person did to me. And you're holding on to that unforgiveness instead of just forgiving them and letting go. And ultimately what happens is when we hold our hands so tightly closed, we're not able to receive. And then we're not able to receive that joy or that grace of Jesus in our lives because we're holding on to things too tightly. And, and as we're holding on to it tightly... We just get angry and bitter, and we can't choose joy because we have nothing but sorrow or grief. And one of the things we've, we've seen with the Apostle Paul is he has the ability to bring joy and grief together at the same time. You know, and I think one of the things that we'll find today is that we'll find strength to remain joyful in hard times um, when we learn to hold both sorrow and joy together, when we can hold them at the same time. 
And a lot of times people, well, there ain't no way I can choose joy in this. We can choose joy in everything we do in life. It's a choice. It's a choice in how we react to things. It's a choice in, you know, everything's going to happen. The difference is how you react to it. Because believe it or not, 90% of what happens is actually how you react to it. It's not actually what it actually is. So, and we'll sit here and we're going to hold on so tightly to things and never let go. And we've got to be able to live in that tension where we can have joy and even sorrow together. And some of us have gotten better at it over the years. Some of us still hold on to things way too tightly. And the things we hold on to, like I said, it could be stuff that makes no sense whatsoever. You know, I've held on to unforgiveness. I'm never going to forgive them. I've held on to, well, this is what I want, not what I need. I've held on to wants a lot too. And it's caused sorrow in my life and it's caused grief in my life because I was holding on to something or, or I'll hold on to what I want to do instead of the will of God. And how many times do we do that in our life? God wants us to go this way, and we choose, no, we want to go this way because we want to do it what way? Our way. And then when we want to do things our way, and it doesn't work out the way that we want it, what do we do? Oh, I can't believe this, and we start to hold on too tightly. Well, if I hold on tightly, it's going to work out. Generally not. Holding on tightly just gets you angry. Gets you farther away from joy because you're holding on to something that doesn't make sense. Uh, you think about anyone in recovery, anyone who's gone through recovery, where whatever it was, that hurt, hang up, or habit, not only did they have a grip on it, but it had a grip on them. And, and as they sit there, that's it, I'm moving away from this, but they keep holding on, and it keeps holding on. And you end up with all that grief. You end up with all that sorrow. And what we need to do is look at whenever we find them situations, look into God's word and say, hey, you know what? What does God's word say about that? We can find truth in God's word for anything. Like I've said, basic information before leaving earth. This is our owner's manual. This is the owner's manual that most, you know, at least we don't shove this one in the junk drawer. You know, we all got a junk drawer that all of the manuals are in. Keep this one near and dear to you, because this one means a lot. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10 this morning. And they read like this. Working together with him, we also appeal to you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I listen to you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. See now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We are not given anyone an occasion for offense so that the ministry will not be blamed. Instead, as God's ministers, we commend ourselves in everything by great endurance, by afflictions, by hardships, by difficulties, by beatings, by imprisonment, by riots, by labors, by sleepless nights, by times of hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, through weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, regarded as deceivers, yet true, unknown, yet recognized, as dying, yet see we live as being disciplined yet not killed, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word today, Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes that we may see what it is you want us to see. Lord, some of your scripture is hard to understand, but may you give us the vision and the insight to understand it. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So when you're reading this, it seems like a whole lot is like, wait a minute, there's so much negative, positive, and it's like, wait, uh, the, there's, there's murder, but life, and there's this, and there's that, and it seems really confusing. And 
as I was reading it and as I was preparing the message, I kind of got the same thing. I said, man, there's a lot of positive and negative going on here. I said, but that kind of sounds like life. Because in life, there's a whole bunch of positive and there's a whole bunch of negative that goes on in our lives. And we actually see that here. And one thing that we know is the Apostle Paul suffered. He suffered physically. He suffered mentally. He suffered relationally. relationally, And yet he endured through it all. He continued to endure through all the suffering that he had. And he was able to live with that tension of both joy and grief. So as we go through them them tensions of of grief, we can also choose that joy, just as the Apostle Paul said. I mean, even in verse 10, you see he was sorrowful, yet he was always rejoicing. The Apostle Paul looked at the positive in everything, and the positive was Jesus Christ. Sometimes we can't even look to the positive in little things, but he looked through it through everything. And I think that came from that maturity and that strength that he had in Jesus. He knew what his call was. He knew he was going to suffer. He knew, every, he knew what he was going to have to go through, but he chose joy, and he, he looked at Jesus as the final prize in everything that he did. And from that, we should be able to do the same thing. You know, and I think we can find that similar capacity to endure them tensions, back and forth, if we do like Paul and look for joy in every situation. We need to remember, he was shipwrecked. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was stoned to the point that people thought he was dead. You know, he got lashings, one shy of death, more than once. He was imprisoned, and then he was eventually killed for his faith. And he chose joy. He chose joy throughout it all. He believed in God's favor, and he believed in God's grace. And I think a lot of times we forget about God's favor and God's grace. And remember, God's favor isn't the same favor that you see inside this world. You know, in the dictionary, favor in the world is approval, support, or liking for someone or something. God's favor doesn't always appear to be that same way. But thank God for his word that we can dig into his word. We can dig into his truth and find out exactly what it is that he wants us and we can remain focused on what he calls us to be focused on. Now, when I was, you know, I said when I was preparing this message, poor Alfredo, poor Alfredo, I mean, he, every day I'd walk from my office into his office and I'd be like, you know, this is a difficult subject. You know, it's kind of tough, all this positive and negative going back and forth. And, and I'm sitting there, and I was kind of going through part of the message, and Alfredo says, did you record that? I said, no. He says, you better record it, or you might not remember to say that in your sermon. Guess what? I don't remember what I said, so I should have recorded it. But at the same time, I, as I was in his office, I happened to look up on the bookshelf, and there was a Max, Max Licato, right? Yeah, Max Licato um, devotional Bible. And I happened to grab it down, and it's actually the New Century version of the Bible, which I'd never read before. And and I got it down, and I read it, and I went, wow, that brought clarity. It brought clarity to the Scripture, and it really changed the way I was thinking of doing the actual sermon because I think it brought more clarity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of this Scripture from the New Century version. And like I said, I think it actually brings some clarity to it better than the Christian standard. So verses 1 through 4 actually read like this. It says, We are workers together with God, so we beg you, do not let the grace that you receive from God be for nothing. God says at the right time, I heard your prayers. On the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you that the right time is now, and the day of salvation is now. We do not We do not want anyone to find fault with our work, so nothing will be a problem for anyone. But in every way we show we are servants of God in accepting many hard things, in troubles, in difficulties, and in great problems. And now to me, that that resonated with me, and it made a lot more sense, because you think about this, we're to be workers together for God. 
Workers together for God. That means it's about God and his kingdom and about his will, right? It's not about mine. It's about God and his kingdom. It's about his will and us doing what he calls us to do. And ultimately, I think a lot of times because we tend to hang on to things, that we hang on to our own will instead of God's will. And if we would just all come together and do God's will and move forward, you know, it'd be a nice, easier thing to do. But we work together with God to glorify God. That should be the focus of every person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. And I think it was interesting, receiving, from, uh, receiving grace from God and not using it. How many people have received God's grace and not used it before? Okay, I'm not alone, right? Okay, because we tend to do that. And, you know, in the CSB or the, even the New King James says, don't receive God's grace in vain. You know, but how many times do we receive God's grace and we take it for granted? You know, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ died on the cross because of his love for us to give us that grace. But yet we won't accept that grace and we don't give that grace to others. And we need to make sure that we never receive it, that we don't receive God's grace and don't use it. If we receive it from God, we should pass it on and use it for others. The other, to, so that uh, not find fault with our work. Not find fault with our work. We've talked about it before, how people look at us as we're Christians, right? They're waiting for us to mess up, right? They're waiting to find fault in what we do. And as Christians, as believers, if we're doing God's will and we're doing what God called us to do, we should be on the right track. But unfortunately, what happens is me and you and them and us and everyone else gets involved, and it doesn't look like God's work. And then the people from the outside, what do they do when they look at them? I don't want none of that. If that's what being a Christian is, I don't want no part of it because they find fault within the church. They find fault actually within the people inside the church. As we bicker, as we dispute, as we don't agree with each other, and generally it comes down to we holding on to something too tightly. You know, even a new believer or you, know, you get a new believer, someone who is on fire, you know, accepted Jesus, got baptized, and man, I want to do everything for Jesus. And then they run into a Christian who's holding on to something too tightly. And then they're saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, the Bible says this but we're over here holding on to something too tightly. And then we're going to ruin that person who's a new believer trying to take that walk with Jesus saying, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to do what they're doing. Man, I, I, th this other church over here, th these people seem to be doing what God calls them to do. They've got joy in their life. Man, this church over here is crabby. These people over here are upset. These people over here, this and that, and then they're going to move to someplace else. And they're going to seek someplace else, or they're going to just say, man, this ain't for me. I'm going to go try something else. I'm going to go live for myself because that's what these so-called Christians are doing, are living for themselves instead of living for the will of God. And how many times have we done that? And then you talk about them not finding fault with the ministry that's exactly how they find fault with the ministry because we get involved with what he has a plan for. And we try and do it ourselves instead of listening to what he says through his word because we hold on too tightly to things. We need to let go and let God. Let's go ahead and continue the next verses. It says, we are beaten and thrown into prison. We meet those who become upset with us and start riots. We work hard and sometimes we get no sleep or food. We show we are servants of God by our pure lives, our understanding, patience, and kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by true love, by speaking the truth, and by God's power. That really sounds like the fruits of the Spirit, isn't it? So in order for us to sit there and, and go forward and say, you know what? I need to choose joy in my struggle. I need to choose joy in everything else. We just need to go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Just go to it. By the fruit of the Spirit is, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do we live with them every day? Do you live with them every day when you're holding on to something so tightly? But that's what we're called to do, right? So isn't it time to let go? Time to let go and let God and live by the fruits of the Spirit and do what God called us to do. And then when we have the tensions in our lives, we can, joy, we can choose joy. We can choose to love someone by forgiving them and not expecting a, you know, oh, I'm sorry, too, back. Release yourself of that grief. Relieve, you, relieve yourself of that anger. Whatever it is, choose joy. Choose the fruits of the Spirit to live your life each and every day. It sounds easy, don't it? Does anyone do that every day? All right, good. I'm not alone. I fail too. Okay? But this is what we're called to do. This is what we're called to do so that no one will see a problem with the ministry and what we're doing as Christ followers. Because Lord knows as Christ followers, we're a bunch of what? Hypocrites, thank you. I got one in the front row speaking quick. Amen. Because we are, and that's what people see us for, so we got to be able to choose that joy. You know, the Apostle Paul then goes on. I love this because he basically tells us as we look at God's Word, we say, okay, here's what it says. Here's what it means. How do we apply it into our lives? Well, this is where the Apostle Paul actually in these next verses tell us how to apply this in our lives. And he goes on and he says this. We use our right living to defend ourselves against everything. Some people honor us, but others blame us. Some people say evil things about us, but others say good things. Some people say we are liars, but we speak the truth. We are not known, but we are well known. We seem to be dying, but we continue to live. We are punished, but we are not killed. We have much sadness, but we are always rejoicing. We are poor, but we are making many people rich in faith. We have nothing, but really, we have everything. Think about that. We have nothing, but really, we have everything. As much as you see the contradiction here, and we could put that in our own lives as Christian, as Christians. You know, we, we, we should have our right living to defend ourselves. If we're living right, if we're living the way God calls us to live, defend ourselves should be very easy, correct? But now if we're putting on this mask when we come to church, hey, brothers and sisters in Christ, great to see you today. And then you leave the parking lot and you're speeding out of the parking lot and you're telling everyone they're number one. And I don't mean this number one. And then you go to a restaurant and you're Man, what a great service. We went to church, and then you don't tip the people, and you leave a nasty note on, their, on, their, on the check stub. Or you argue with the people at the corner. You go to the grocery store, and you get road rage while trying to grocery shop. Hence why I don't grocery shop. My, my bride does it for me, and she gets the road rage instead of me. Are we truly showing what we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to live when we do that? No. We, we've got to choose and have that right living. Are we going to fail? Yes. Each one of us is going to fail. We're not going to have that perfect 100% right living all the time. But if we live more like Christ every day, we'll be able to defend ourselves better each and every day. And of all the things listed there, we go through. There's people who honor us, people who honor you for what you do, but then there's people who aren't going to honor you. They're going to blame you for everything. You know, there, there's evil's going to be said about us. is also going to be good. You know, there's a lot of good said about Christians. Christians do a lot of good things. Most of the time we hear the evil things. But think of all the missionaries around the world. Think of all the people who get fed, clothed, everything else. And who does that? A lot of you Christians do it. They take them extra steps to go forward and do it. You know, they look for joy in their situations. Some say we lie. Others say we speak the truth. Well, God knows who we are, and as long as we speak his word, we speak truth. And before I, I go on, for those of you who weren't here for Wednesday night Bible study, uh, well, actually a business meeting, but during the prayer time, something came up, and it just totally amazed me. And if you, you get the prayer list, 
You see that uh, Joanne's got a young man on there named Elijah who's got leukemia. Well, on Wednesday night, we found out that Elijah's collecting money for an orphanage in India. Elijah's 13 years old. Elijah is suffering from leukemia. He's hoping that his younger brothers, you know, they say his younger brothers are match and maybe next year they can get some bone marrow transplant. Through his suffering, he is thinking at 13 years old about orphans in India. He doesn't, he's not allowing his suffering to stop him. He's choosing joy in what he's doing. He's raised, what, $25,000 already? Some, already. Not, choosing joy in suffering. 13, how, many, thir, how many of you, when you were 13 year old, thought about orphanages in India? No, none of us. Young men back here in the back, any of you guys think about orphanages in, in India? How about in Haiti? You ever think about, you know, what you can do to support orphanages and, you know, feed people in Haiti? These are things at a young age that we should be looking at. And even at an older age, all of us, we should be looking at choosing joy through our suffering. And we've got it good here in the U.S. as much as people, man, I hate it here. Well, other countries aren't much better. We've got 17 missionaries who just got kidnapped in Haiti. And the gang's talking about basically had coffins out there and was talking about putting a bullet in their head if they didn't get the ransom. They're gonna, they could very well die for their faith. When's the last time one of you felt like you were going to die for your faith in the U.S.? We need, we need to choose joy in suffering. We need to look beyond our circumstances and look at how we can help somebody else. How we can help someone else, no matter how bad we may think we have it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, and we need to continue to move forward. Okay, I kind of sidetracked. <laughs> um, but, but you think about, you know, God knows us. God knows us. We know his truth. We spend time in his word. And how many of you have been hurting and God showed up? Give me a show of hands. All right. That's what I thought. So we know that he's going to show up during times of trouble, right? So if he's going to show up during times of trouble, why do we hold on to it so tightly? We need to let it go. We need to let God, because we know he's going to show up and he's going to change our circumstances. Maybe not at that very moment, but through time. You know, we've, we've been praying for Jerry. Jerry got a great result. Praise God. There's still other people inside here that we're praying for that are still fighting that battle. So we need to continue to pray for them. We need to continue to go to God and continue to go to his truth, knowing that he's going to show up. Knowing in his time, he is going to show up. And we got to just be persistent in it and choose joy during that time of suffering. Continue to seek him with it and live through that joy and that hope amongst everything that we do. You know, as we live with this tension, I once read a story about a tightrope walker. His name was Charles uh, Blondin. And back in the 1800s, he was going to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. So he was going to be 1,100 feet up, and I think it's something, I don't remember how far, huh? maybe 168 feet up, 1,100 feet across. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you know it's a long way to walk. So, of course, there's no safety net, no nothing, and you know, he was an entertainer and a promoter, so he went into town and he talked to, you know, got it all drummed up about how he was going to go walk across this tightrope across Niagara Falls. And no, it didn't disappoint. The day showed up in the crowd. It was packed. And there were people there who were there for no reason whatsoever except to jeer him and be like, yeah, you ain't going to do it. You know, those negative Nancys that we all have in our lives, you know, so. a... Uh, Sorry if there's any Nancys. Um, <laughs> you know, those negative people that we have in our lives that, that are always going, to, oh, you can't do it. Oh, that's never going to be done. You're not good enough to do that. Then, of course, there were people there to try and build them up. Oh, man, you can do that because, you know, we have them in our lives too. 
And then there are some people who are just there to be able to say, hey, I was there. You know, we all got some friends like that too. They're just there to say I was there. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just kind of neutral, you know. So you kind of had all these people here and, and you know, he was, like I said, he was a promoter and all of a sudden he got up there and he gets on the tightrope and he starts to do some stretches and he, and he starts to stumble a little bit, but he gains himself. And so now people are really getting into it. Man, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. You're never going to do this. So he grabbed his pole and he started to walk. Well, I remember he's an entertainer. So as he's walking, he's kind of stumbling, acting like he's going to fall. And people in the crowd are like, oh, you know, he's out in the middle. He's almost going to fall. Oh. And he finally makes it all the way across. And when he made it across, he knew he had their attention because everybody cheered. So he turned around and he walked back. So then when he got back, everyone's going crazy and everyone's cheering. Well, he didn't end it there. He actually walked back and forth five more times. So five more times, so he walked back without the pole, back and forth. He took some, uh, like, bowling pins and juggled going across and coming back. He actually took a chair, went halfway out and sat down on the chair and relaxed for a little bit, finished walking over and back, then went and got a hot plate, walked out to the middle of the tightrope, sat down and cooked himself lunch got up and continued walking. So by this time, you know, the crowd's going crazy. And, and if you were watching this, I'd be going, he can do it all. Man, he's got this. Well, then he broke out a wheelbarrow. And he turned to the crowd and he says, hey, I need a volunteer. No one got in the barrel. They've seen him go across basically now six times. He's went back and forth across. He's made lunch out there. He's done all this out there. And all of a sudden, guess what? I trust you can do it, but I don't trust you in my own life. It's basically what they were saying. How many of us do that with God's grace? We see him over and over and over again do things in people's lives. We see him over and over again in our own lives, showing up and showing off in our life. During times when we're holding something so tightly, he shows up and tells us, just let go. I've got this. And we won't allow him to do it. We won't get in the barrel. And some of us need to just jump in the wheelbarrow. Just jump in, all in for what God's called us to do. Continue to walk what he's got you walking instead of trying to do it yourselves. Because when we do it ourselves, we fail. We fail when we do it ourselves. You know, we, we, as believers, we've got to put our hope and we've got to be faithful in our God. Be faithful in the outcome that he's got planned. Even if it's not the outcome you have planned. Because he is bigger and better than we are. The Apostle Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul understood what it was like to chase after Jesus. Everything he went through. He persevered through that tough time, and we need to do the same today. We need to persevere through this world and stop holding on to things so tightly. Receive his grace, and as we have that tension of pain, be able to have joy at the same time. And it's a whole lot easier to, say, to be said than done. And I know because I struggle with it myself. I'm not expecting you to be able to leave here today and say, I can do that. It's going to take time. It takes time to be able to do that in our lives. And the more mature you are, the more that you seek God, the better that you are in his work, and the experience that you have knowing that he has been there before, to know he's going to be there again. And then we're able to choose that joy in them times, in the struggle, when things aren't going our way. Remember, our way, not his way. We got to let go and let God do what he's doing. And I honestly think that if we do that, if, if we can learn to choose joy based on the truth that's in God's word, I, I think as we do that, we will find strength and remain joyful in hard times. We can then
find strength and remain joyful in hard times. But we've got to learn to hold on to both sorrow and joy at the same time. It's part of persevering through this life. It's everyday life because every one of us is going to have joy and we're going to have some type of pain. We're going to have some type of grief. And it's going to happen every day. That's where perseverance comes in. That's where not holding on so tight that your forearms get all pumped up and the nurses in the room are all excited because they can see the veins ready to take blood out of people. Gigi back to, yeah, preach it, pastor. <laughs> you know, but we do. We hold on way too tight. Let go. Just let go for once. Because all of us are holding something. All of us are holding something. Time to let go and let God. And during that tension in our life, Choose joy. Choose joy. When's the last time you chose joy? Hopefully today. And for, for some of you, you may be going, well, pastor, you don't know my life. You don't know what I'm going through right now. You don't understand the tension that's in my life. And maybe I don't. But he does. He understands what we're all going through and he can provide that grace for us. The thing is, we just need to receive it. We need to receive his grace each and every day. And you can't receive it with closed, clenched hands. You can't receive grace like this. You've got to open them up to be able to receive. When your hands are clenched, you can't put nothing else in them. If your hands are open, you can get more. Open up and let go. And maybe just, you know, pastor, you come on up here and I'll pray with you about it. I love to pray with people. Come up here, we can pray about it. Or you can just come up here and go straight to God. And Lord, I'm struggling. I'm holding on to these things way too tightly. And, and, and Lord, I need you to help me to release them. Because some of us need to release some things. Need to release it so that God can do what God has called us to do. And that we can be a church that is united and that is joyful as we go forward. So that when people see us, they see the love of Christ. They see Jesus in us. As we choose that joy in our lives. And if you don't know Jesus, I encourage you just come on up because he's going to accept you just as you are. He's going to accept you being messed up. He's going to accept you being jacked up because he still loves you. And in his word, it says we all fall short of the glory of God and that we're all sinners because we all are. Even after becoming a Christ follower, you're still going to sin. Just so you know, newsflash for some of you. We're never going to be perfect till the day we meet Jesus. We can strive to be excellent, but we'll never be perfect. And God's word said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you don't know Jesus, I encourage you to come on up. I'll be standing over to the side. We'll say the sinner's prayer and we'll welcome you to our messed up family. And you can help us bring some joy to other situations along with Jesus. Well, maybe you've been walking this walk for a while and you realize that, man, I've strayed. You want to recommit your life and, hey, I need to get back on the right path. You can come up here and recommit your life to Jesus. I don't know what it is. You do, and he does. I don't. I know myself. I know what I need to put at this altar. And I spend many a days during the week at this altar in prayer. 
especially when I feel like I'm holding on to something too tight. I'll come in here and just leave it at the altar. So I invite you to leave it at the altar today and let go and let God and choose joy in times of suffering and sorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we, we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul. Lord, as we see in his life that, you know, we're never going to have it all together and, and, and we see everything he did for you and he still suffered. Lord, we are no different. We are no different than the Apostle Paul. If anything, we may be a little worse. But Lord, I ask that you touch our hearts, open our eyes so that we can see what it is you want. Lord, that we won't hold on so tightly and that we will let go and let you be who you call us to be. Because Lord, we hold on to some silly things for no reason. Lord, help us to release them and seek you in it all. And Lord, that there will be no offense apart upon this church because of what we do, but that people will see love, joy, patience, kindness, forgiveness in us, that they will see the fruits of your spirit in us and everything that we do. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.